Um, and speaking about priorities, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's start off with a quick story. There was a bunch of friends, a bunch of buddies, and they decided to go hunting. All right, and so they split off into pairs of two, and they went out for the day with the intention to meet back by the campfire that night. And as they made their way out, they went hunting all day, and, and sure enough, two by two, they started coming back to the campfire, and there were still two missing that they were waiting for. And as, and as the last, they're all waiting, they just saw one guy walking back down the trail, and he was, he was holding the weight of this beautiful eight-point buck that he had scored that day coming down the trail alone. And then the rest of the hunters yelled out, where's, hey, Harry, what happened to Joe? And Harry said, oh, well, Joe had a, Joe had a stroke back a couple miles back up the trail. So he's, he's back there on the trail. And the, the hunter said, what are you talking about? You left Joe on the trail? And he said, well, yeah, nobody's going to steal Joe. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about priorities. We're going to talk about what are your priorities? <laughs> What are your priorities in life? Understanding that Jesus is our priority. Let's, let's pray about that before we get going. Lord, we thank you so much. Father, we pray right now that, that you would just speak to us in this moment, Lord. We don't want more information. We want transformation. We want to meet you here. So, Lord, we invite you. Would your Holy Spirit fill this place, fill our hearts, and prepare us for what you have? Lord, whether it's a, a hug or a spank, Lord, I pray that we would take it, understanding that you have love intended in those things. The love of a father that would, that would hug and punish, Lord, that is true love. And so, Lord, we invite you here today for that purpose, that we would put you in the place of honor. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen, guys. We're going to be in Colossians today in chapter 1. And yeah, we're going to be talking about priorities. Do you have trouble prioritizing things in your life? That's going to be the question for the day. Everybody's got priorities. Everyone's got stuff in their life. We got, we got jobs. We have life. We have family. We got school. We have kids. We have ministry. There's so many things in our lives. And which one gets the priority? The cool thing is that you and I, we get to decide what things get priority in our lives. And I'll tell you right now, let's be real honest. It is not your words that will decide what the priority is. It's your actions. Wives, raise your hand. Wives in the room today. Ask any one of these ladies in the room, any wife in the room right now, did they feel like a priority to their husband this week? And they will tell you it's not the words that he said, it was the actions that he showed. He demonstrated that she was a priority to him. Husbands, got to act it out. All right? So you saying, hey, you're a priority to me, is not as important as you taking out the trash and doing those things. Guilty. I forgot to take out the trash this week. So everybody has troubles prioritizing things, right? But as we're going through the book of Revelation here at One Love, we need to remember who the revelation is of. It's the revelation of? Of Jesus Christ. But who's that? Who is that? Amen. Who is Jesus? What is he like? Hey, from Genesis to Revelation, God reveals to us that in every situation that Jesus is the priority. I mean, from the beginning of the book to the end, it points to Jesus. And when we catch, what we want to do is just catch a glimpse of his character and his nature just for a second. When you just understand a little bit more about God's nature, man, it, it excites you. It helps you to bump him up those levels of priority. And not just one big category of priority, but all the little compartments of, of priority in your life. We got school, we got family, we got these things. Is Jesus the priority in your family? Is Jesus the priority at school? Is Jesus the priority? Ooh. At church? Whew, that's a tough question. So today we're going to try and catch that glimpse into the nature and character of God. And in doing so, we're going to try to start moving him up. The word preeminence is going to come up a lot today. Preeminence is just kind of a big word that means he's the paramount rank or dignity or importance. Jesus is the preeminent. He is of high importance, the highest importance of the highest rank. And there's two great reasons we're going to talk about this morning on why he's preeminent. Two great examples. The first one is going to be he's preeminent in his creation. He's preeminent in his creation. The heavens declare the glories of God around us. Right? We're going to see that today. And the second thing is he's preeminent in his new creation. Right? The new creation of you and I as the church. We're going to see that he creates things from nothing. You and I, we understand how to build, right? We can build, but we cannot create from nothing. God says, let there be, and there is, there was, right? So you and I, we're, we're of a recycle, reduce, and reuse generation. Anybody remember that little green dinosaur back in the day when I was a kid? Recycle, reduce, reuse. 
close the loop. It was a good song. It was catchy. Um, but we, we're a recycling kind of generation. We don't comprehend the and let there be. Right? And so his creation has already begun, and he's developing his creation, you and I, right now. And this is why he has first place in everything. So that being said, we're going to try to get a hold of his nature and character today, and that's going to show us his preeminence. Verse 15 is where we're going to start. We're going to go in a whopping eight verses today. It's going to be a fun eight. Somebody was like, wow, eight verses. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to start in verse 15. It says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. Now, some of your Bibles might say the Son is the image, but He is the image. How do we know we're talking about Jesus? Because if you're reading Colossians 1, it was talking about Jesus. He is this, Jesus is that. And in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God. Also, side note, I want to say this. During this study this morning, we will be addressing a couple, just a few, of some of the weightiest, biggest questions ever asked of all time. Some of the questions that philosophers and scientists, Plato and Aristotle, have pontificated and thought out, we will be addressing some of those questions. And can I be so bold as we're going to answer them in about 45 minutes. Amen. Yeah. With the power of Jesus, we're going to be answering some of those massive questions today. First question is going to come up on the docket. Ready? Who is God? Who is God? Side question to that. What's he like? Who is God and what is he like? We have to stop because in verse 15, it says that he is the image of the invisible God. You see, if, if I was to say that I am Jesse, I am tattooed, you could respond in describing me and saying, he is Jesse, he is tattooed. The two statements are interwoven. You can, they are interchangeable, right? If you say, I am, he is. So here we have Paul saying, he is the image of the invisible God. Well, on, on the flip side of that, you have God himself saying, I am. Back in Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Right? So now we have God. We have God of the Old Testament confirming, I am God. Will you fast forward to the New Testament? And Jesus does the same. He says in John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. John 8, 23, and he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. John 8, or 8, 58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. And in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anybody enters by me, he will be saved. You see, I talk to people sometimes and they say, you know, that whole Bible, isn't it? Jesus never said that he was God. And I go, have you read it? Have you connected those dots? Because over and over, Jesus will say, I am. And Paul, here in Colossians, will say, he is. He is God. Now, if the Father says that Jesus is God, and Jesus himself says that he is God, who do you say that he is? Who do we say that God is? Keep your finger here and flip to Matthew 16. Because to answer this question, who is God, we're going to take it directly from Jesus. In Matthew 16, if you guys flip there in verse 13, it says this in Matthew 16, or you can read it above. It says, when Jesus came to Caesarea and Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Here it comes, ready? But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Can you imagine Jesus Christ staring you in the eye in an honest moment and going, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Man, that's a big question. You see in Matthew 16, that huge question, the biggest one will ever be asked in our lives. Is he a stranger to you today? Are you guessing? Do you know the character of God enough to answer? Like Simon Peter answered. He answered correctly, if you're wondering, good for him. Um, but do you know the character of God? So what was the key to Peter's correct answer? How did he have that correct answer? Well, the answer to that one is he, he walked around with Jesus. He ate with him. He talked with him. He, com he did communion with him. And so do we just confess with our mouths that we love him, that he's the priority, that he is God, or is it in our actions? Did we show it this week? Was it exemplified in our priorities? No, Jesus, you have priority over that. I can give that to you. See, the church, what I see is slightly weakened 
these days. Because the message that's being spread is not that he is, it's that we are. We are. We have the coolest sanctuary. We have the best teaching. We have the sound doctrine. We are. Image of the invisible God. He is. Such a difference between we are and he is. It says the image, the image is translated, that word is the, it's, um, uh, excuse me, a physical representation, an exact physical representation of somebody. So when you say that someone is the spitting image of their dad, you're the spitting image of your daddy. You know that? What does that mean? It means that they look, act, talk, gesture somewhat like their dad, okay? And I'm going to break the bad news to you. Ready? It's inevitable. You all resemble your parents in some way, shape, or form. And everyone was like, I don't like this guy. I don't like, I don't like the truth that this guy's telling right now. I resemble, my dad wasn't around for the majority of my life. But I tell you right now, my mom, every time I tell stories, see how I talk with my hands? I can't help it. I talk, that's the same way my dad tells stories. My mom will look at me and go, how is this possible? How is it possible that he wasn't around that much, but you still gesture and walk and talk just like him? It's inevitable. You can't escape it. See, if God is the image, Jesus is the image of the invisible, he's the spitting image. Has anybody here ever seen God? Have you ever seen the face of God? No, absolutely not. He dwells in light. He's unapproachable, right? Indiana Jones knew what was up in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. He had to close his eyes, right? When the ghoulies came out of the ark. When he opened his eyes back up, there's a lot of dead Nazis laying around, right? You cannot look at God, but Jesus... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but Jesus, being the spitting image of his daddy, now gives us a tangible look at an unapproachable God. Because Jesus Christ, we can now have insights into the character of God. John 14, he says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Here's another reason why character is so important, knowing the character and nature of God. It's non-refutable. It is non-refutable. Those of you who are saved in here, what did you know about Jesus on the day of your salvation? Have you read the Bible from cover to cover? Even the chapter called Maps? Had you read that one? Had you been to seminary? Did you have a, a, a degree in theology? No. All you knew was a couple character traits that made you fall in love with him. Yes? The day, the day I got saved, I didn't know much. I got saved at the age of 24, and when I fell in love with Jesus, all I knew is that he loved me. He gave all for me. I didn't need all of that theology. I just needed to know a little bit about his character, right? It's the same as my wife. When I fell in love with my wife, I did not know every single thing about her. I just knew a couple things that made me go, I'm in love. (laughs) Four foot 11, she had braces when I met her. I went, "Mm -hmm." (laughs) mm-hmm. Right? But I did not know all those amazing little quirks and details and beautiful things that God had woven into her. That's what I have the rest of my life to find out. I have the rest of my life. I have every day to learn those beautiful things about her. But when I fell in love with her, it was just a couple things. Right? And I'll say this. My wife was the first person that ever told me that Jesus loved me. 24 years old, nobody had told me. My wife looked me in the eye and said, did you know that Jesus loves you? And then he died for you. And I went, oh, I didn't. She told me. And I married her. So tell people that, you, that Jesus loves them. It might work out well for you. Okay. But then once you're hooked, once you're in love, all you want to do is learn more and more about her. All you want to do is learn more and more about God once you are hooked. You see, also, it's non-refutable. Now that I know my wife's character, if somebody came up to me and said, hey, bro, um, I saw your wife the other night down in Chinatown kicking puppies and yelling racial slurs on the corner, (laughs) I would go, I think you saw another 4'11 tattooed girl. Because that doesn't sound like my wife. I think you got the wrong person because I know my wife's character, and that's not in her character, right? It is the same with Jesus, right? Just a few character traits of Jesus, ready? Uh, in Matthew 27, throughout the scriptures, you find he's patient. In 1 Thessalonians, he's self-controlled. In Luke, he's forgiving. 
He's loving, joyful, peaceful, kind, good, faithful. He's gentle. He's available, humble, courageous. He's full of grace and integrity. He's just and loyal and merciful. He's selfless, sensitive, powerful, tolerant, generous, pure, and above all, he's holy. And that's just a few things. That's a few character traits about Jesus. That's skimming the surface of a very deep ocean. That is our God. Every new thing you learn about the Lord, though, should cause you to place him higher and higher in the priorities of your life, to allow him to be the Lord more and more of those areas. You know why? Because he deserves it. He deserves that place of honor. Why does he deserve that place of honor? I'll tell you right now, if some of you don't know, I was in the U.S. Marine Corps for four years. I was in the infantry. I went overseas. I did that whole thing. Every guy that I served with, I know I don't look like it. Everyone just went, Burr? right? <laughs> I know. Hey, every guy that I was in with, though, was a Marine. You got pinned with that Eagle Globe and Anchor, you're a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. But I tell you right now, you do n not know who a true warrior is until you get shot at for the first time. When you get shot at for the first time, when the stuff hits the fan, most people put their heads down, stay put. But it's the warriors that stand up and take ground. Is it not? Those are the ones that take ground for the good of the group. My hope and prayer is that today, this morning, as we seek Christ's character, that we would see that he took the ground for you and I. He made it safe. He paved the way that you and I could follow and have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. So we're still in verse 15, I know. Here we go. Verse 15, at the end of 15, it says, he's the firstborn over all of creation. I want to point something out. This means that Jesus is not, this does not say that Jesus is a created being. We know from Genesis 1:26 when God said, let us make man in our image. It was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in a huddle going, what do you guys think? In our image, right? It was, right? He's not a created being. What this does mean, though, is that just as the firstborn in the biblical sense had certain rights, Jesus had all the privileges and rights. The word that's used there is in the Greek protokos. It's priority. So it says that the priority over all creation. It's the same priority that's used in the story of Jacob and Esau. One was born first. One was born second. One should have had the birthright. One sold some soup. Right? And so the other one got the birthright instead. He had priority. This is why Jesus is able to calm the seas, to walk on water, to command angel armies, because he is the protocost, the priority over creation. You know why? Because it's his creation. Amen. And the creator does what he wants with his creation. Verse 16 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, visible and invisible. You know, we live in a beautiful place. Hawaii is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I live 10 minutes from the beach. I live 10 minutes from hiking to a waterfall. It's when it rains, it's warm. I tell people this back on the mainland. They're like, what do you mean it's warm? <laughs> I'm like, it's Hawaii, man. It's warm. You walk outside and dance in it. It's beautiful, right? But I would dare to say that the most beautiful parts of God's creation are the invisible ones. The greatest parts of creation are invisible. Air, magnetism, electricity. These are things that you can't necessarily see, but we enjoy the effects of them. As I oh, breathe, I'm enjoying God's invisible creation. We're going to talk more about invisible in a second, though. For all things were created through him and for him. Who made the universe? God did, right? He spoke it into existence. So he spoke the world into existence. Who is, who is uh, uh, excuse me, called the word in the Bible? Jesus is, right? So it says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word, or excuse me, the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. And the world was spoke into creation through Jesus Christ. All things have been created through him. We're going to address another one of those big, weighty questions right now. Ready? You guys, you want to write it down? It says, what is my purpose in life? Ooh, it's one that people have sat on rocks and omed and crossed their legs for centuries. What is my purpose in life? Why am I here? Right? Let me give you a little picture of what this means. I'm going to go out today after this Bible study's done, and I'm going to get in my minivan. Okay? I know it's lame. I drive a minivan. I have kids. Don't hate. Okay. Um... <laughs> I'm going to take a snorkel, I'm going to duct tape it, 
to the hood of my minivan. I'm going to drive it down a sand island off the docks. I'm going to go down into the water. I'm going to scoot around and wave to the fishies. Does there sound like a problem with this? Yes, my minivan is not a submarine. It's a minivan. It's made to transport children's, okay? It's not meant to be a submarine. You and I, if you're a Christian in here today, you're meant to glorify God. What is your purpose? Why am I here? You are meant to glorify God. So if you live your life to that purpose, you will be satisfied. It is fulfilling. Anybody ever do something, accomplish something, whether it's digging a ditch or building a house or sharing the gospel with somebody, when you're done, when it's complete, like, wow. Maybe it was just to build a card house. When you get that thing tall, you're like, yes, I feel accomplished for the day, all right? Maybe you should aim a little higher than a card house, but... <laughs> If you do it your own way, if you live your life to fulfill your own purpose, you're going to drown like me in a minivan at the bottom of the ocean. You're not meant for that. See, wide receivers catch the ball. Firemen put out fires. Ballerinas dance. You ever seen a wide receiver can't catch the ball? Didn't last too long, did he? Probably got traded to a third-rate team. Okay, you ever seen a fireman that is afraid of fire? What is he? What is he? Just a cat getter? Is that what he is? Right? You ever seen a Christian who doesn't live their life to glorify the God of the universe? Unfortunately, you have. And that's a sad thing. It's unfulfilling. See, when I say that sometimes we get our priorities messed up, what areas of our lives are we keeping Jesus low in priority? Because here's the thing, in verse 17, we're going to read, it says this, He is before all things, and in all things, or excuse me, and in him all things hold together. We're going to be talking about three ways in which Jesus holds things together. You ready? The first reason, the first way that God holds things together is physically or biologically. He holds things together. It's this thing called Colson's Law of Electricity. You see it everywhere. It stands true throughout everything. And the law is that like charges repel each other. We've all seen it, right? You're in school, two like charges, put them together, and you can't get them, right? Like charges repel each other. This is 100% true in everything, except, except in this, except in the very element, the very fabric of your being, the thing that you were made up of. There are protons whizzing around in the same, protons positively charged, and for some reason, they stay together. They make pono, they hug. When everything else in life says that they should run from each other, you are held together right now. And people don't understand. Scientists don't know why. A lot of people just call it atomic glue. Okay, it's science's rationale for God. They can't see it. It's invisible, but it holds it together. What we've actually found out is these things are called laminins, okay? And I, before we get there, I wanted to just say this. God is holding you together physically right now. At a moment's notice, if God so chose, he could stop holding you together. I was listening to the radio, and, and Pastor Chuck was on the radio, and somebody called in and said, hey, Pastor Chuck, um, I just don't understand how people could deny it's the rapture when there'll be millions and millions of dead bodies laying around the world. How could you deny that? And I loved Pastor Chuck's answer. It was, who said anything about bodies? Amen. Bible doesn't say anything about bodies laying around anywhere. Who said that? See, in 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The very elements. When God says, you're all done, he will whew, cease to hold you together. And you will open your eyes in heaven. You'll go, what just happened? Right? These things that, that we call atomic glue, these laminates, I find it interesting that this is what they look like. I find it interesting that if you take a microscope and look at one of these laminates, that is what they look like. This is what is holding you together. Christ, right now, as you're sitting in this seat, is holding you together. Why would he be holding you together? For a purpose, right? To glorify him. The second way in which God holds things together, spiritually. He spiritually holds you together. He gives us substance and community, a common bond and like interest, and that is him. Right? If you like God and I like God, oh, you love my favorite thing. Right? When I was a kid, my grandfather always used to tell me, interesting, or excuse me, interested is interesting. I was scared and small and skinny and, you know, howly, and I would go to school, and I didn't grow up here, but I was white either way. So, um, 
I would go to school and I was always nervous, like, how am I going to make friends? Grandpa, they're not going to like me. You know, I got beat up a lot. And he would just look at me and say, buddy, interested is interesting. You want to make friends? Go ask questions. Be interested in them. Okay. And I'd go to school and go, hey, I like your shirt. It's pretty cool. Uh, 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 where'd you get it? And then I just asked questions. And sooner or later, people were like, this guy's interesting. And I'm like, I just ask questions. <laughs> it actually kind of tends to our sin nature a little bit, our own selfishness. I ask you a lot of questions. You go, man, that was one of the most interesting dudes I've ever met. I just talked about myself the whole time. It was great. <laughs> But here's the deal. We all have different interests. Some like this and some like that. Some like that kind of food. We may not have those interests. But if you love Jesus, you and me, we can hang out. Because you love the very thing that I love. If he's your priority, he's my priority. We talk about our priorities together. I one time, my wife and I were taking these two young ladies home from a Bible study that we were doing at the ministry center, and it was like Friday night, we're bringing them home, and these two young ladies were sitting literally in the back seat, separate, 14-year-old girls, one over here at the window, and the other one at the other window, and I'm like, and it's like, quiet in the car, there's nothing going on, and so I start asking, hey, what do you like, what do you do, I'm being interested, right, what do you do, what do you like, I'm like, oh, I don't know, one of the girls says, I said, well, what kind of stuff do you like to watch, and she said, well, I... I, I, like the, I like Japanese animation. I like anime. And the other girl went, oh. <laughs> And she went, you like anime? She went, I do. Do you like anime? She went, I do, I do, I do. Oh! <laughs> I wish I wouldn't have said anything. I, could, I couldn't stop them from talking. I was like, what about books? Do you guys like books? Talk about books. <laughs> oh my goodness. So if you like the same thing I like, hey, what do you like? Oh, I like Jesus. You like Jesus? I do like Jesus. He's my priority. He's mine too. Ah! (laughs) You and me can be besties. I don't even have to fake liking you. (laughs) I can just genuinely like you. It's awesome. So he gives us substance. He gives us community. He holds us together. He also gives us common goals. Hey, let's glorify God together. Hey, you love Jesus? I do. I love Jesus too. Hey, do you want to glorify him today? Hey, would you hold me accountable? I do. I would love to do that. Right? (laughs) Personally, the third one, personally, he holds us together. Can I just say, God's holding my life together right now. And I see heads nodding and I hear like under the breath, amens. God is holding a lot of people, everybody in this room together right now. You got babies, you got family, you got school, you got this, you got a lot of things on your mind. And Jesus is holding it down for you. He's keeping you sane. I mean, my wife and I, we got two babies and full-time work and ministry and all these things. And we got no family here and Jesus is holding us together. Glued together with the cross of Christ. There's some of us here that are just hanging on for dear life and God's saying, just give it to me. He says, come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take that big old eight-point buck off your shoulders and hand it to me. I can carry it so much easier than you can. He's holding us together. Verse 18, it says this, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. He's the head of the body, the church. You and me, now we're talking about that second creation. First, we talked about his first creation, but you and me, we're his second creation, his new creation, the church. See, the building is not the church. You and me, the people, we are the church. Jesus is the head of the church. He's not a facilities manager, all right? He's in human resources. He does not care about a building. He cares about you and me. He is not part of an organization. He is part of every organism. There's a difference. There's a huge difference that somebody comes to church and says, well, I'm going to go visit Jesus on Sunday inside of a building. And someone says, I'm, I'm visiting him right now. Everything I do, I'm prioritizing him. I'm glorifying him. I'm with him today. He is with me We treat him like that sometimes, though. We treat him like he's a facilities manager. Like all we got to do is wave to him when we come in here on Sundays. Jesus is the head, it says. And what does the head do, right? My head, stuck on my body right now. When my head turns and I go, my body goes, right? The head leads, it corrects, it adjusts for you. It's the first place. It coordinates, right? And so it is with Christ. He leads, he corrects, he coordinates, he adjusts 
uncomfortably sometimes. He spanks you sometimes in his adjustment to you. Your body just does not want to go, but he's going to take you because it's his glorification he's after. God is at work building the church right now. In Revelation 21, it talks about new heaven and new earth. This one, gone, passed away. The one, I think it's funny that the one thing from this earth, from this creation that will make it into the new world is his new creation. God created you and I and his church. And he went, I tell you what, it's the only thing that's getting through. Where's your priorities at? Because I tell you right now, that car ain't coming with you. I tell you right now, that mortgage, that house, that toy, that boat, it ain't coming with you. But you can come with, you can come with. You're invited into the party. New man, new earth, new creation made in Christ. Old man, old earth, gone. Because he is preeminent in his creation, the church, we should hold everything up to him. He is, Christ is the standard to which we hold all things up to in comparison. He is the standard. And then when we do that, we can see what is good and honest and true. And sometimes we can just see what is, though, that's a little funky, actually. That's not quite right. Example, one of your friends say, hey, you go to church? I go to church too. Why don't you come with me on Sunday? Sure, that sounds great. I love the Lord. You love the Lord. And you show up at his church and and they're doing human sacrifices. (laughs) What? What? Right? (laughs) Imagine raising your hand for a lay in that church. That'd be uncomfortable. (laughs) But they tell you it's what God would want because Isaac was asked to sacrifice Jacob. So that's what we do here. You don't even have to know, like have a theology degree or have read everything. You can just go, T.O., time out. Doesn't sound like my God. I know the nature and the character of God, and that doesn't sound like him. So I tell you what, let's dig in. Let's find out why that feels funky to me, okay? It's not the character. But how do you know? that it's wrong or funky unless you hold it up to God as the standard. It says this, it continues on, beginning firstborn from the dead. Jesus has priority over death. Why? Because he conquered it. He smashed death. The grave could not hold him. Death could not keep him. He's not afraid of it. Death is no big deal. Can I just share with you a little medical insight? This is going to blow your minds. Ready? 10 out of 10 people die. (laughs) I know. It's like the Colgate challenge. It's amazing, right? Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. It means he's unique. He is unique. How is he unique? There was other guys raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead, right? Jesus did that. So how is he unique? Well, he's unique in the fact that when Lazarus was raised from the dead, he died again. He died again. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, he is now considered the living God. He did not die. He ascended, but he's living, waiting for you, preparing a place, longing to be the priority in our lives. So he himself may come to have first place in everything. Does your church get first place? Answer is no. Are you one lover here today? You should say, no, Jesus gets first place. Does your religion? No. Does the Bible? No, it does not get first place. Jesus and Jesus alone gets first place. Oh, but let me tell you about my theology. Wow, I got a rad theology, man. I know my doctrine. Let me tell you about it. Can I just tell you there are some guys that sounded like that and they... They were called Pharisees. I don't care about Jesus. I care about my theology. I care about the scriptures. I know them. Are we, are we going to be Pharisees? Out of all things, Jesus did not like Pharisees too much. But that's what exactly what we do sometimes. It could, hey, it could be great, but let me tell you about this. This might be greater. Jesus says himself, there's one greater. Hey, hey I, I understand Jonah, but there's one greater than Jonah, and he's right here. I understand the temple is great, but there's one greater than the temple, Jesus said, and it's right here. I imagine Jesus going right here, like not around somewhere, let's go find it, like right here. Listen up when I'm saying it. He's greater. He has preeminence in everything. That word in the Greek, everything, what does it mean? Oh, smart. Yes, you all are scholars in here today. It does. It means everything. But unfortunately, we keep him out of certain parts. We kind of live our lives a little bit compartmentalized, don't we? Like, unfortunately, a lot of Christians today are living their lives like a bento. <laughs> right? We got school over here. We got, we, got, we got friends over here. We got family over here. We got church over here in the little ginger dish, the small one. Right? But they all have little walls in between them. Nothing mixes. Nothing goes into each other's little compartments. Can I tell you, that is not the biblical model for a relationship with Jesus. This is the biblical model for a relationship with Jesus. A big pot of chili. 
Our lives are supposed to be lived like a big pot of chili. The main ingredient in the pot is Jesus. You put everything else into it and stir. (laughs) That's all you got to do is stir. And everything else in your life takes on the flavor of Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you, who who knows that great feeling of being starving and you come in the door and there's good smelling food cooking in the house? You walk in, you're like, oh, I'm so, ooh, chili? (laughs) Everyone loves that feeling. Hey, you stir. That's all we're called to do is stir the ingredients together with Jesus Christ. And it is like a sweet aroma. Jesus will walk in your spiritual house and go, ooh, what's for dinner? That smells good. I like that. Our life should be like chili. And that means first place in everything, in our values, in our family, in our finances, our victories, defeats, in the words we use, in the time we spend on things, in our possessions, in our relationships. And might I be so bold as to say, in his church? Wow, that's a tough one, right? That Jesus would be the main ingredient in his church. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. Why the whole Jesus thing? Why did it have to be Jesus? I'll tell you why, because it pleased God to set things up this way. It pleased God to have Jesus be the spitting image of his daddy. Why? Because through the death on the cross, through Christ's death on the cross, we can now experience God. We can approach him. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Everybody starts out as an enemy of God. Our great, 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 great granddaddy, Adam, messed that up for us. You and I, this is not a class where you start out with an A and you try to keep that A. You start out with a zero, with a fail. You're an enemy to God before you know him. But the great news is, Think of your own life in the past. Think of you in here that were saved. I was saved at 24 years old. 24 years of rotten ways and stinking thinking. And I got saved. And, and the, the Lord went zero, A plus. How easy is that class? That's the kind of class you want where you just show up and go, I'm in. And the teacher goes, you get an A. You're like, taking you next semester, right? Yes! (laughs) You show up. Take roll call. Get your name on the list and just sit there and listen and learn more and more about him. Let it change you and transform you. See, in verse 19, it may sound a little bit cocky when it says, he is the best for you, basically. Oh, but see, he is the best for you. It's not cocky for Jesus to say that he's the best for you. It's just true. It's just true. And he so fully knows that he's the best for you that he would die for you to the point where he would say, over my dead body. You go to hell over my dead body. That's how much I love you. And so you and I, we got to take a big step not to love Jesus, not to accept that. We have to step over the body of Christ and disregard his work on the cross. He laid it down. John 15, 13 says this, Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. And if you do whatever I command you, notice this word that keeps getting used over and over of friends. From now on I call you not servants, for the servants knows not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. What did you just say to me, Jesus? Did you just say that I was an enemy and in an instant you went, you're my friend? That is mind-blowing that God would be such a peacemaker that he would look at you and say, just be my friend, please. I'm giving you my friendship. I'm giving you relationship. Would you please have it? Would you please take my friendship and make it a priority in your life? In verse 21, it says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, verse 22, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. You see, I want you to notice the way that those two verses start. It starts out by saying in verse 21, once you were, but then in verse 22 it says, but now he has. Once you were, but now he has. He is. Not we have, he has. 
It is not, although you once were, now you started going to church, so you're all right. It's not, hey, although you once were, now you help in the children's ministry, so you're doing pretty good. Hey, although you once were, you stopped cussing, so awesome. Hey, those things, those things are called New Year's resolutions. Those things are the things we break two days after New Year's. All right, come on, be honest. It's like, I'm going to lose 50 pounds. <laughs> right? <laughs> Moving on. Those are called New Year's resolutions. But God's saying, you once were, but now he has. Now I have. That's called reconciliation. That's not a resolution. That's reconciliation. Why did he die to make you a friend of God? Why? Not just to forgive us, but it says to present us holy and blameless, without blemish. He presents you and I perfect to God. You see me, me in front of a perfect God? No, 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 no. My face would would melt off like Indiana Jones movie. But with Jesus in between, now he can look at me and say, I have missed you. I love looking at you. I have longed to stare at you. Do you understand that God longs to stare into your eyes? God longs to be with you. But you need that filter. You need Jesus to filter it. You see, in my Bible, I have a little piece of paper here. And this little paper, let's say, represents me. It's fairly crisp. And this is how I see myself a lot of times. Isn't this how we see ourselves? Pretty crisp, pretty good, pretty clean. Unfortunately, our perception of ourselves is not always reality. Because if we are enemies to God and have a sin nature, God actually sees us like this. You're an enemy to God. But what if, could God, could God handle that? Could God pick that up and touch that and love that? But it said that Jesus is the word. What if, what if Jesus covered you? What if God, when God the Father looked down, what he saw was perfection? You're still here. You're still present. You're covered. You're covered by the blood of the lamb. And when God looks at you, he goes, I love you. I missed you. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for becoming a friend and accepting that work of the cross. Now, now I, can, I, can, I can have my time with you. I can spend quality time with you, and you can get to know me more. Not just to forgive us, to, but pre- to present us. He wants to present us blameless. Man, I, I'm humbled by that fact. Me? Like me. Do you know what I've done in my past? You know where I've been? You know who I've hurt and how I've manipulated? And you want to present me? I feel like, as Paul said, a, a sit, talking about sinners, of which I am the worst. Anybody else out there feel like that? Of which I am the worst. This is Rabbi Paul saying that. But he's covered. He's covered by Jesus. Verse 23 says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm. We see a really big word. It's two letters. Ready? What did it start by saying? If. If. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope of the gospel. This is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. It says, you want this? You want that kind of relationship? Continue in the faith. Stand in Christ, firmly established and steadfast. Give him priority. Let him be the protocost, the priority in every area of your life. See, what places in your spiritual house are you closing the door on Jesus? He's welcome in the house. Come on in, Jesus. I'd love to have you in my house. Jesus says, great. I'm so happy to be here. Can I go check that room out? Ah, actually, not not that room. You can have anywhere else. Anywhere else, Jesus, but this room. Oh, Okay, well, maybe I'll just go in the cabinet and fix myself some food. Actually, you know what? I really like the way the cabinets are. Could you, um, could you not touch the cabinets? Jesus loves you enough. He gives you the choice. He goes, okay. Sometimes in life, we can inch the Lord out of our spiritual house. Inch by inch, step by step. No, no, thank you. Not there. Oh, please, could you not touch that? Until we have Jesus standing in the doorway. And he's going, this is, this is all you're giving me. Could I come back in? 
And so that's the choice we make. With our actions, we decide where he is in the priority scale. See, it talks about this great term, the hope of the gospel. You who have believed in Jesus, you who have believed in the hope, keep believing, it says, firm and steadfast. And if you haven't believed, I have two words for you. Come on. Come on and join us. Stand firm on the hope of the gospel that Jesus loves you and wants a relationship with you. Christianity is spelled completely different from religion. Religion is spelled D-O, do this, do this, don't do this. But Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E, it's done. Jesus did it on the cross for you and I. And all you got to do is say, I want that. I want to stand on that. See, the gospel is the truth, the truth that you and I were made to be presented holy and blameless to God, that Jesus is the priority over all things, and he gave his life as a peacemaker for you and I. So I ask you to do it now, to do it now, to go to your mediator. I am not your mediator. No man is your mediator. The God-man Jesus Christ is your mediator. You go directly to him. You don't come talk to me. You want to come talk to me about him? Man, you and me BFFs all the way. You want to talk to Jesus? You go to Jesus. Go to him right now and just say, forgive me, a sinner. And he will make you a friend now and forever. Verse 23 says, I love this. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation. Now, whether you believe it or not, but even that guy in the bush, in the deep, deep jungle, who's never seen a Bible. He has been proclaimed the glories of God around him. Creation has been presented to him. So if you believe this gospel, if you're in there right now and you're like, I'm on board, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, and you believe in this gospel, then and he gets first place or first priority in your life, then you're like Paul. You are a minister to this hope of the gospel. Your calling is to love him, fulfill your purpose of glorifying him, to tell people about him. You're a minister just like Paul was. And if you haven't, if you have not yet believed in this hope, if this is new to you, if you're like me at 24 years old and I'm the first person that ever looked you in the eye and told you that Jesus loves you and gave his life for you, look me in the eye. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. And what I need to say about that is if you don't have a relationship with this preeminent son of God, you no longer now have any excuse. From this day forward, if you're new here and you've never heard this, you will never be able to, from this day on, say, no one ever told me. If you don't accept and you stand there on judgment day and the Lord is standing in front of you, you can't say to him, I never knew. Because he'll go, remember that skinny tattooed Holly dude? I know he was weird, but you should have been listening. He told you how much I love you. He laid out how much I loved you. So if you haven't yet believed, I'm sorry, but there's just no excuse for anymore. But the question is, will you continue to be a stranger, an alien to God, or will you allow him to reconcile you and clean you, to wash you and make you a friend to God? Will you let Jesus present you holy and blameless and without blemish to the Father? Will you answer him today? So if you'd like to answer, I want to put the opportunity out there for those people whose hearts are pounding, whose whose mind is just screaming at them and overwhelmed who's shaking in their seat. If you're sitting here today and you say, "I, I want to stand on that hope, we here in here will be praying for you, but I would like to see if anybody wants to make that declaration today and say, I want to be in love. I want to be in love with the one that loved me first. Can I just ask you to raise your hand if that's you today? Thank you very much. God bless you guys. Yes, right back there. My friend in the white ball cap back there. Anybody else? I mean, we're clapping today. We're clapping today because we know how awesome it is. And because you just declared to me you love my favorite thing. So we're all excited. Does anybody else want to say they love my favorite thing and everybody else's favorite thing in here? I'll give you, I don't want to wait too much longer, but... For those of you that Paul would describe as a minister of Christ, a minister of this hope in the gospel, I want to do something different today. These these folks were brave enough to raise their hands. Do not let them leave here today with nothing but a new believer's packet and say, good luck. I'll see you next Sunday. Don't let them leave here today. Attack them. (laughs) 
Share phone numbers and emails. Hug them. Talk to them. Interested is interesting. They might be like, man, he was awesome. And all you had to do was ask about them. I would pray that their next week is full is booked because the family, the ministers of God surrounded them left and right, back and front and said, what are you doing for lunch on Monday? Hey, what are you guys doing for dinner on Tuesday? Hey, what are you guys doing for this on Thursday? Their week would be slammed. They'd be like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I was signing up for this. You are. (laughs) I want us to start being a family, not just see you on Sunday, bro. God bless you. Good luck in your week. Would you please, I implore you, I beg you, please gather around these new children of Christ and celebrate with them for the next week at least. Let's make him priority today. Priority number one. Let's stop wasting time and and compartmentalizing things in our lives. Let's stop saying with our words that he's our priority. Yeah, praise God, praise Jesus. And let's start acting it out. Whether you're a husband or wife, you can act out and and do this. You can do life with people. You can live your life to satisfy and and live in that goal of glorifying Jesus. Because let's be honest, when you meet people who are in love, it's intoxicating, is it not? When you meet two people, it's slightly annoying, but a little bit intoxicating. (laughs) Right? You hang up. No, you hang up. You hang up. You hang up. Both of you hang up. (laughs) Right? But when you see that young lady who's still so in love with her husband or, or with who, and, and she still lifts her leg when they kiss a little bit, don't you kind of go, oh, <laughs> it's intoxicating, right? I tell you right now, are you in love with Jesus? If you are, if you truly are, and you're in love with him, and you say, I love him so much, people will see it in you. They'll smell it on you. What just walked in the door? Is that true love? Kind of smells like chili. <laughs> I would ask that this week you would let your light so shine that people would be intoxicated by the love relationship you have with not just a religion, not a building, but a true living God who loves you, died for you. He's the love of your life. He's the love of your life. He's the love of my life. And what I would ask you to do is after they see, after they're intoxicated and like, wow, what do you got? Introduce them. Listen, introduce them to your true love. I love my wife so much that when people come up, I'm like, have you met her? When people talk to me, like I had somebody come up and say, man, your wife's really awesome. I'm like, yeah, she is. Let me tell you more about her because I'm excited because I love her so much. Four foot 11, spunky. (laughs) I love it. If you haven't met her, you should meet her because she's the, and I tell you right now, every husband in this room, should be saying the same thing. My wife, best woman on this earth. And if you are a husband, you should be battling with me on that. No, my wife's the best. No, my wife. And we have a game. Let's play that game. I like that one. <laughs> um, let's do it. Because the truth is, our God is the best. He's the love of yours and mine's life. So thank you for these brave hands that came out today. I want to pray for them, and I want to pray for all of us, and we'll be done right now. Lord, thank you so much. Father, I just ask for these brave souls today that that said, we want you, Jesus, because we realize that you want us. Father, I pray that that our family here today would surround them, would just take up their time and share. And let's talk about our true love more and more today. Let's encourage each other. Lord, you hold us together 100% physically, spiritually, personally. You are holding us together, God. Lord, would you, would would you just help us to seek your character more and more and more? Lord, help us to fall in love with you more and more. Help us to remove the walls in that bento life that we've been living, of compartmentalizing our life, Lord, and, and let us live our lives as a sweet aroma to you, with you as the main ingredient, Lord. Lord, have access right now. We invite you to have access into every room in our spiritual house, Lord. And Lord, we pray that if we're stubborn and prideful, that you'd break down the door, that we're not letting you in. God, we need you and we love you. Lord, I pray for for blessing and protection over our our new friends, our new family members who have raised their hands today. And I pray a blessing over the ministers of the hope of the gospel that are sitting in this room right now. Father, that they would 
the love they have with you or for you would be intoxicating and people would see it. We would be set apart and peculiar because of our love. As Christians, we are defined by our love for you. It's what makes us. It's what changes us. It's what makes us different from everybody. It's radical. So Lord, I pray that we radically love you and allow you to pour into our lives right now. Holy Spirit, fill us. Prepare us for a week. Prepare us for a week in a world that tells us it's all about us, that we are. Lord, help us this week to remember that you are. (laughs) That he is the image of the invisible God. We love you, Jesus. We cannot say enough that we love you. And if you never did another thing besides that cross, Lord, it would be enough for us to praise you and honor you as the priority in our lives. Amen.